Good morning and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Leadership in Insurance podcast, otherwise known as The Lip. Um, I'm your host, Alex Bond, and I'm lucky enough to, to be joined by John McCurland um, of My Broker. Um, John and I have never spoken before, so we're, we're going to go straight off the bat. He's been very brave. So, if, um, <laughs> so thank you, John, and, and welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex, and uh, thank you for having me on here. And I'm excited to uh, to share what we've been up to with your listeners and, um, you know, a little bit about our experience in Lloyd's Lab, a little bit about our experience, uh, you know, running an insure tech, and uh, we'll see where the conversation goes. Amazing. Yeah, brilliant. Well, look, obviously, you're running my, my broker. I, I came across you because you were involved in the Lloyd's Lab. So probably a good place to start is, um, yeah, can you explain to the listeners like, like, yeah, what my broker is, how it works, and, and, and what your sort of product and service offering is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I uh, fell into insurance like many do. Uh, we have a family insurance brokerage here in Toronto. And um, so I've been a licensed broker here for 14 years. And about three years ago, I've, I've always been very um, interested in startups and interested in technology. I kind of uh, taught myself how to design and develop websites uh, a time ago. And it just was a natural interest. It, uh, it got to the point where Googling and YouTube videos, all of a sudden I was doing more stuff on the website than the people we were paying thousands of dollars a month to run the website. So I just took it over and, uh, and things went from there. And uh, I'm very fortunate to be based in Toronto. We have a, a great startup community here in Toronto with lots of events as well. So I got the chance to meet other founders, um, not necessarily in insurance, but um, founders doing other things. And, um, you know, some of them were nice enough to spend some time with me and talk about, you know, the, the craft really of listening to trying to identify some of the problems, I guess, in, in the industry that you're working in, how to craft your solution, how to do it without breaking the bank, and, and all of these kind of standard startup things, which were, uh, were very foreign to me at the time. So I got excited to try this out in insurance. Um, we launched my broker about three years ago, really as an evolution of the traditional brokerage. Um, and what that allowed us to do was to take some chances on some newer emerging technologies without scaring our traditional book of business, which is obviously very important. And uh, we love our long-term customers. They're, uh, they're, they're what pay for all of this essentially. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, but we were able to do some experiments with things like live chat and chat bots and uh, electronic signatures and SMS. And most of these things are pretty standard now, but three or four years ago, um, not as much. And, um, and where that kind of led us to was, um, was a place where we, uh, we found uh, an insurer partner who was willing to, uh, you know, had similar thoughts in terms of how to, uh, how to innovate in insurance. And, uh, and we worked on this, um, on this pilot program, uh, which we call My Control, and that's the, uh, the on-demand um, business insurance app. Um, and that really, you know, it's, uh, so it's an iOS, Android and, uh, and web app that allows people to essentially, uh, quote and bind their insurance. Uh, the unique thing with it in Canada, at least is they can choose a, a one day policy or consecutive days or an annual policy. Um, so it's fairly unique. There's a few, um, insure techs I know, um, in the UK and in the States doing this and, um, you know, but we saw it really as solving a lot of problems for our customers, um, as a traditional broker. I'd always get the call from the uh, panicked photographer who's uh, shooting a wedding on the weekend and they just found out they need business insurance and that they don't have it. They thought maybe it was part of their condo owner's liability or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had to tell them like this process takes anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. It's probably going to cost you around a thousand dollars Canadian for a policy and you have to get an annual policy term. And, uh, you know, that's not a great solution for a lot of people that are freelancing or just starting out. Um, mm-hmm. They don't necessarily, especially if they're digital natives, they don't like committing to the longer policy term. Um, we have limited payment options in Canada. So the thought of paying for something all up front with a check was crazy. They probably didn't even have checks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and just the, the time that's needed to quote a traditional policy and bind it um, for, for most product lines isn't... Uh, doesn't compare well with what people are expecting when they're buying things off of Amazon or ordering their Uber, right? So they expect Mm -hmm. insurance to be like other industries and much more uh, on demand. So Mm -hmm. that's, uh, we're trying to provide a solution to some of those problems that they have. Yeah. So is that where it's born out of? I mean, there's been a theme in a few of the other um, podcasts I've done is is essentially, it's that feedback loop of of the ideas come out of the customer, you know, it's, it's customer demand that drives it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's the right way to build something like this. Um, and I was fortunate to be in insurance already. So I had um, a good idea of those of those problems. And mm -hmm. then, so I'd say it's kind of one part of that if you've got your, your innovation mixing bowl. And, uh, you know, another thing is um, you have to have uh, have the right partners or um, or as someone once told me, dance with the person that wants to dance with you. So, <laughs> you know, trying to pitch um, like episodic photographers insurance or, or some other um, class of business that's episodic to uh, to our existing insurance partners um, didn't go great, but we mm -hmm. eventually did find the right partner. And that's when things kind of came together. So that's yeah. part of why we focused on photography. It could have just as easily been um, been something else, uh, you know, but uh, they had this product that included photography insurance as a, as a class and they were willing to adapt it for us. And, uh, and I knew from my experience that this would be uh, something that's highly in demand and it, you know, kind of went together from there. Yeah, yeah. So, so how long is the, um, is it a long standing family broken business that, that previously worked for? It, it is, yeah. So I, the uh, third generation, we were established in 1971 by my grandfather. Wow. And, and, and so the, the, the business is separate to that runs in parallel or, or is, it, is, it, is it a standalone piece or is it a division of? The... It's, a, it's a division of the uh, existing family brokerage. So um, we decided to structure it that way. Um, it, it makes things a lot easier in terms of licenses and company contracts, for example, which I think is something that, um, you know, a lot of new entr entrants struggle with. Um, they usually don't have the licensing. And or maybe they have one insurance partner, but they, they can't get other contracts and it's a really tough sell. And then uh, we'd always get them knocking on our door saying, hey, we just want you to like sign off on these policies and we're going to like run everything over here. And it's like, no, no, that's that's not a good that's not a good arrangement for us. But, um, you know, when you've got people involved in uh, in the company uh, like this, uh, setting up as a division and uh, and having that separate branding um it was really important that the branding was, I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's just branding, but um, you know, with a traditional brokerage, McClellan insurance brokers limited um, and my name's on the sign, obviously, but I was going into meetings with people my age or younger and they're like, Oh, like you're John. Like I was expecting this guy in a suit and like McClellan insurance brokers limited sounds so scary. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, I think important to, uh, to connect with digital natives to have like a more modern uh, brand, uh, which is part of the reason we did it that way as well. Mm. I think there's so much in that experience that that's come up so much. Like you know, I'm, you know, I'm 39, and 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 so therefore on that cusp of you know, I remember I remember it being very much non-digital when I started. You know, I I, I started in insurance straight out of university, and and the, the volumes of paperwork I had were enormous. And um, you you know, you look at it now, but but just my consumer journey as a buyer of anything you know insurance or like you say use of amazon has far outstripped my experience of kind of my consumer journey as a kind of business owner and a buyer of business products and um it's interesting how antiquated um the business world seems when 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 the consumer world seems to move so much quicker and i think that's <laughs> absolutely um, yeah and i just think that's that seems to be a challenge so i think that something like photography um is interesting because you know they are presumably that most people are solopreneurs and they're like you say they're doing they're, they're sort of self-employed people so the most of their kind of buying experience is as is, is a person you know for them for their person rather than as a commercial entity um so trying to get them to buy into kind of this business uh world of buying insurance like the antiquated thing with like checks is is going to be difficult so actually it's not like I think what I'm getting to is that it's not sort of competition for existing policies. It's bringing new people into the kind of business framework of insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. I think, um, you know, and I'm, I love that you use the word solopreneurs. Um, that's one I've been using more and more because uh, I had trouble defining who these types of people mm -hmm. were um, at the outset. And uh, the closest parallel is kind of some of the trends that are going on with the gig economy. Yeah. But that's not really fair to call them gig workers. They're truly solopreneurs or freelancers. And uh, they've been doing this, you know, especially in photography since long before the trends that we've seen uh, in the gig economy. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a growing um, market as well. Uh, lots of people uh, like working for themselves or like getting into the gig economy for, um, for various reasons. It's not always digital natives. Sometimes it's people... Um, picking up a second career or something that starts off as a hobby and morphs into a, a paying job or um, 
or, you know, a second career after retirement, maybe someone wants to stay engaged and active, um, you know, retiring off to a beach somewhere isn't for them. So they, mm -hmm. uh, they, they have this, uh, this solopreneur career. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a new market that I think the incumbents aren't really responding to well. So it's not necessarily, you know, these are mostly uninsured people currently. So yeah. we're not really taking business from them. Um, this is, this is addressing uh, a new market. It's, it's new money. It's, it's new premium coming in and, uh, you know, we're giving them a better, better experience than what a, uh, what a traditional brokerage can a lot of the time, I think. Mm. I, th I find that really, what I find really interesting is that you are, you're such a, you're in such a unique position to talk about innovation and innovation take up because you've got this, you know, family history and experience of being a, you know, working in the, the traditional insurance market. And then, and then it seems to me like you're, and let, please don't let me put words in your mouth, but in terms of your, it's exactly that it's evolution. You're, you're using technology to kind of bring in new business rather than, I think often technology um, is viewed as a kind of a threat or a risk to the incumbent, whereas actually it's just an opportunity to kind of bring in new revenue, revenue streams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely see it as an evolution. And I think insurance is, um, is certainly going to change a lot in the next five to 10 years. Um, I'm not sure we're going to see the disruptive um, innovation that we've seen in other other segments, though, like mm -hmm. uh, the closest thing, you know, the, the closest thing we have to success here probably in, in North America would be Lemonade. So they started off doing tenants policies. And um, they seem to be making a go of it, but they've, they've definitely had their struggles with profitability. And, uh, you know, if you look at some of the other more simple kind of like disruptive technologies and startups, um, you know, something like Uber or, um, you know, any of the kind of social media realm ones, insurance is way, way more complicated than any of those things. I know there's regulations involved with ride sharing, but um, when you look at, you know, if you're trying to disrupt uh, the current, uh, you know, distribution channels, and insurers like to be a startup insurer with with almost no experience and you don't have the actuarial data it's it's crazy and a lot of companies have fallen on their face with it you know it looks easy from the outside but like a lot of things once you get into it um, you find out how complicated it really is um, so i think that's why we're going to see this as uh, happen as more of an evolution in insurance uh, i think there's companies and uh you know forward-looking marketplaces uh like some of the underwriters at lloyd's who are who are saying okay yeah this is going to change we want to be the ones driving the change rather than have it uh thrust upon us mm -hmm. and uh what does it look like you know if you could start from scratch what would your ideal insurer and distribution channel uh situation look like 10 years down the road without mm -hmm. the baggage of the last uh, few hundred years mm -hmm. yeah exactly so i mean talk about lloyd's obviously that's 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 how I came across to you, and that's that's why I reached out because you've been through the Lloyd's lab. Um, what cohort were you in? When when were you uh, when were you in the Lloyd's lab? Uh, we were in the second cohort, so that was uh, that was around spring summer 2019. Yeah, sure. Um, I literally think I spoke to someone this morning from the second cohort as well. It's a, no way. Do you remember <laughs> who it was? Um, it was uh, Michael from Describe Data. Is, uh, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know Michael well. He's uh, over in Ireland there, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I hope things are going well for them. I'll have to make sure I tune into that episode as well. Yeah, yeah, you should do. Yeah, no, he's a great guy. And um, yeah, we, 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 we spoke this morning. But what was your experience of the Lloyd's Lab like? Um, you know, what, I'd be interested to see like what you got out of it. And, and was, it, was it what you hoped to get out of it? Or was it, was it, was it how you imagined it to be when you, when you took, took it up? Yeah, it was, um, I mean, as someone who's been in insurance for uh, for almost my whole career, it was uh, it was an amazing uh, getting to go to work every day in that building and um, and, and working um, in the market. You know, we we learn about that in our like our level one licensing, the history of Lloyd's and all of that. And I am a bit of a history nerd, so um, so I certainly enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, and then something that I'd always known about Lloyd's, um, but it came. Uh, really like smacked me right in the face when we got there is just how complex and how many uh, moving parts there are to the market and how it functions. Uh, you know, I've, I, I know a lot more than the average person, obviously about insurance, but it is really hard to wrap your head around and get all the relationships of, uh, of everything that's going on at Lloyd's. Uh, so that, that certainly took some time. And then in terms of what, what we got out of it, I guess, you know, we were pre-launch when we were there, we had, um, 
we had some demo versions and MVPs that hadn't been publicly launched yet. So uh, one thing we were looking for was some some feedback on that, and uh, and that was great. One of my uh, mentors uh, was actually working at Hiscox, so I got to run the stuff by the Hiscox team um, a few times, and uh, they're obviously very experienced with uh, with direct digital sales. Mm-hmm. Um, so they shared what they could with me. No uh, no state secrets, I don't think, but um, it was interesting hearing how an established insurer. Uh, looks at those things and develops those types of products. Yeah. Um, you know, something I think we were hoping to get out of it that hasn't come together yet would, would have been, you know, offering some some different uh, products on the um, on our platform, yeah. um, specifically drone uh, liability insurance is something we were looking at, and it complements what we're doing with the photographers and videographers. Yeah. Um, so we weren't able to get there, um, but I think, you know, with Lloyd's. And, and the global insurance market in general, it really is about those relationships that you build. And mm-hmm. it's not always uh, a right away thing. Sometimes things can come uh, together further on down the road. And that's just the way it's, uh, it's meant to be. It is, um, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about this, but I think it is a bit of a problem sometimes with, um, with incumbent insurers that uh, everyone, you know, it, it's important, especially as a startup as well, to talk about market size and, and market penetration. Um, but I think in insurance, especially when you talk about um, building new relationships with um, with insurers, um, it always comes down to like volume and what volume are you going to do in the first year? Yeah. And, uh, you know, as a fairly straight shooting startup, I was very realistic with those numbers and we were not talking millions of pounds of premium in the first year, certainly. Uh, yeah. For me, it's about getting the product out there in a MVP form and then listening to feedback and then continuing to build on that. So I like having the luxury of kind of taking time with it, but um, it's not just in the UK, certainly in Canada too, like most insurers would not be willing to partner with a startup because of that. Um, Mm. You know, unless you're somehow a startup that uh, can magically guarantee them millions of dollars of premium in the first year, uh, they're probably not interested in partnering with you. And I think the industry as a whole loses out on a lot of um, interesting opportunities because of that stance. I I understand why it's there, but um, the, uh, the photography on demand product that we were able to build on my control, for example, the insurer took a much more non-traditional uh, view of that. They were like, volume's important, but it's maybe not as important in the first year or two of, uh, of an experiment like this. It truly is an experiment. You're testing uh, what works and what doesn't work. And they're following up with me, you know, monthly to talk about how things are going and what we're working on. There's accountability there. But um, you know, if they had have said, you know, you need to sell $2 million in your first year, or we're going to pull the plug on this thing. Um, it, it would have been really hard to, uh, to make a go of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's come up quite a few times. And, and look, just from a headhunting perspective, I mean, the, the closest I get to that is when we're trying to pitch people with MGAs. And, you know, sometimes I see people that have got quite an unusual, maybe niche um, product um, that they're trying to offer, and they want to do it in an MGA platform. And, and, and sadly, there's a there's a scale issue, you know, if it's not of a certain number year one, if it's not $5 million, then it's really difficult to get through the door. Um, But then what tends to happen is that we see people inflate the numbers to get in the door, and then the numbers don't get hit anyway. So um, yeah, sometimes question whether you, um, you get paid off for being an honest, an honest broker. Um, and, And I think we're guilty in business insurance as many others um but in not taking a long enough long enough term view because for example i would i would look at your product and and look at it and say right exactly that it's it's testing the principle it's test it's testing the the consumer base do, do they want to adopt it do they engage with it um do they like it and then you can roll it out to like you say whether it's drones or whether it's something else or um you know, would it be applicable to the film industry? Um, can you then add products on the, you know, uh, when you're, because uh, something's come up, I, I trained as an actor. So, you know, being on film set, you pay a huge amount of money for film coverage, but you're not using everything every day. And, and, and there's a lot more DIY stuff now, but you might, you might be borrowing some kit on one day and then other kit on another. And it'd be nice not to pay a blanket cost for all of that kit that you've supposedly got out when you're not using it on that day. So, um, but they've got to buy in long term because there's no point kind of flowering up what you're going to offer in year one and, and committing to kind of this huge number when realistically it's about it's, it's not proof of concept. It's beyond that. But um, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's making sure that you get the product right and then you can scale it up. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, it's, it is more than a proof of concept. Um, like it does more than just function at a basic level, right? But it's uh, what we call this over here is a minimum viable product or cool. an MVP. So it's the, it's the bare bones minimum of what your customer will actually use and accept. Um, so if you compare that to, uh, to an incumbent insurer, I'll, I'll pick on Hiscox again, because most of your listeners are probably familiar with them, but you know, they've got a very good digital offering that's very well thought out and very mature. Um, and they probably spent several years and, um, and potentially millions of pounds developing that. Um, so that's not, that's not feasible for a startup, nor should it be. That's, that's mm -hmm. the waterfall technique, right? Hiscox looked at what a perfect digital offering would be, and they went out and did it. Yeah. Um, what we're doing is different than that. It's starting at the bare bones, the very minimum of what you need, and you, you don't build any useless parts. Like, I don't know. I'm not a mind reader. I don't necessarily know what these customers that are solopreneurs are going to need or, or want or expect from an offering like this. We learn that as we go and then we, we layer onto it. And yeah. eventually after a few years of doing that, uh, we hopefully get to a uh, we've just gone about it in a different way. Yeah, sure, sure. And I think that's, that's, that's been something that I've noticed about uh, particularly in Shortex is, is there's much more drive to kind of the MVP model, which is very much the tech the tech framework, isn't it? You, you build your MVP and then you continue as improvement and, and, and evolution of that of that product. Whereas in insurance, we, we typically, I suppose because of the nature of the beast is you, you can't almost test a, you can't test the product because if you test it and I, you get your wordings wrong and you get some huge losses out the back of it, it's, it's too risky. So it's almost like about getting it perfect first time. Um, but, but something like, you know, if you're looking at distribution, you can be more flexible with that. Um, and that's quite interesting. Um, where, where, do, where can, is it just um, operating within Canada, North America, the product at the moment? Can, can you? Just, um, just within Canada. Yeah. So it's, um, we're licensed in Ontario, Alberta and British Columbia, which are um, three of the largest, uh, most populous provinces um, in Canada. And, uh, you know, certainly moving into the United States would be a goal of ours, um, but it's uh, it, it's kind of going to be in that next uh, next phase for us. Um, North America is a complicated jurisdiction to do business in, so you have to have separate licensing in each province and state. Mm -hmm. um, so to go North America wide, you're looking at like 60 um, different jurisdictions. So uh, I would need a small compliance team, you know, working with me by the time we get to there. Um, Ontario is a great place to be. And uh you know, we're, we're happy with it. I, and I take your point, certainly it's difficult for insurers. Um, so maybe it wasn't a great example of using someone like a Hiscox, but uh, you can't, you can't obviously um, approach an insurance product as a startup like that, because you've got to have the wordings down. Everything's got to be airtight, as you say. Distribution, um, we're a bit more fortunate because we can be more flexible. Um, you know, I haven't done this yet, but uh, you know, other people in startup competitions or incubators um, can test out the market. You don't even necessarily need like a real company or a real product behind it. Like you can kind of test out that that flow and that consumer product fit um, before, you know, you even have anything behind it. It can be kind of more of a lead gen portal, um, which allows you to experiment around with the questions. Um, you can test out market size that way. Um, so there are there are a lot more options available to us on the distribution side um, in terms of kind of uh, this incremental learning and uh, and fake it till you make it approach. Mm -hmm. So what's um uh, you you were saying there's a good startup scene. Um, how have you? Oh, I suppose I don't know what your lock. What's the lockdown situation where you are? Is is there a <laughs> lockdown? Is it fine? Is, you've got so yeah. much space, nobody nobody needs to worry about it. Or <laughs> yeah, we've um, so. Uh, Canada was probably a few weeks behind the UK in terms of uh, when things hit really badly in March. So uh, our bad week in North America was um, around about uh, March 13th, actually. So everything kind of late that week, uh, slowly things started getting much worse in North America and people could kind of see where we we're headed. Um, so by the following um, week, which I think was the 17th, we were, you know, most businesses were working from home at that point. So uh, we were fortunate, even on the traditional side of the business, we had work from home policies in place and laptops and uh, and the technical tools that you need to make that work in place. So it really was like a flick of the switch for us, which um, which was which was nice. I think a lot of uh, more traditional companies, uh, it took them you know a couple of weeks to to find their legs with that. 
and that's really how things have mostly been going in Canada. So some brokerages I know um, starting back in August have gone back to more of a hybrid approach with people in a physical office. Um, we've, we've resisted doing that because, um, you know, our case counts have jumped back up in the fall. So mm-hmm. I think we recognize that we're in this for the long term until community spreads completely eliminated or there's a vaccine. Mm-hmm. Um, remote work's working well for us. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to be the future of work 100% remote, but um, we don't really see a reason to head back into the office at this point. Um, social events, which I think is more where you're going with this with this question, have been uh, you know pretty much eliminated. Um, some weddings have still been going forward, <clears throat> but those have been uh, there have been issues with those with uh, with spreading of the virus. So I, I think we're back down to some fairly limited numbers in terms of those events. All of the networking events, um, you know, including kind of the tech scene and the startup scene, have gone remote. So um, that's been been different. Um, I definitely miss getting together with people and um, having a pint and talking about what they're up to and what they're building. Um, I've gotten maybe a little bit burned out with some of these more virtual type events, but um, they were done, I think, pretty well. And uh, and maybe I'll get back into them. Um, We did a number of ones on a platform called uh, Hop In, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but um, Mm. You know, essentially, you've maybe got a keynote speaker, and there's like a live chat thing, and um, there's a cool networking component to it. That's almost just like a a networking roulette or like a speed dating uh, networking. Mm-hmm. So it'll randomly match you up with someone, and uh, and there's a timer. So that's uh, the hosts determine how much time you're going to have. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to one that was, uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't insure tech focused. This one was more just tech focused. It was kind of like founder dating. So they were trying to match up. Um, they, they, they actually interviewed people or got you to fill out almost like a dating profile. And it was like, if you're a technical person, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what are you looking for? If you're more of on the business side, what is it you're looking for? And they tried to match people up based on that. So that was mm-hmm. kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, the neat thing I find with these platforms is um, when you're doing the networking in person, you know, when it works, it works great. But uh, sometimes at a large event, it's hard to actually have meaningful conversations with people. You know, you're standing around in a group, everyone's got a drink in their hand and you're, you're talking small talk or whatever it is. Um, with the one-on-one connections, uh, you know, you could actually have a, a really good conversation, even if it was just for a few minutes with someone as opposed to that more crowded setting. Yeah. And um, often the, the keynote speakers would participate in this aspect of it too. So I got to have some really neat one-on-ones with people who uh, I never would have been able to get their ear at a larger, more traditional event. So I found that aspect kind of neat as well. Yeah, I found that. I mean, I I I, I attended one event and um, I was quite surprised because it's quite funny when when you turn up at an event and obviously most of the time I'm focused on insurance or insure tech events. Um, as soon as you find people find out you work in recruitment or headhunting, <laughs> so, <laughs> they sort of disappear. They don't want to be seen talking to you in case their boss hears. But now I now I'm just sitting there. Um, I got quite a few people add me. I, I went to one where you you could add people and request a meeting, and and then you know I sat down and had some really good conversations with people. And um, um, I, yeah, I, I'm the same. I liked it um, because despite what I do for a living, I, I I still find those things quite intimidating. You know, you're in these big big rooms. There's lots of people. Lots of people already know each other. You've kind of got to go and you know it's that awkward thing of finding a sort of right opportunity to go talk to people whereas kind of the sort of formality almost um of a a kind of virtual conference is you can you have that one-on-one time and and therefore like you say you can cover a lot of ground a lot quicker which is great um Mm -hmm. but yeah then you can get and uh one thing i'll just add a great thing with it i I like I, i forgot to mention is uh there, that timer, um, you know, sometimes it's unfortunate that the conversation ends before it, it needs to. But um, I think we've all been in these situations in person where you get pinned down by someone and you're not very interested in the way the conversation's going or they're trying to sell you something that you're really not interested in. And I'm just <laughs> nice to have that two minute excuse that our time's up and you move on to the next thing. <laughs> Is that my cue to end this uh, podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Not talking no, to you, no, Alex. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm but, here um, for the duration. But no, it's good. It's, I, I think I think it's interesting, but it's, it's difficult. I think it's like when when lockdown started and everyone's doing quizzes and, um, you know, that that got old pretty quick. Um, it's, it's the variety. I, I miss I miss the face to face stuff. Um, one of my clients put it brilliantly. He said, when you meet people face to face, they can be um, wonderfully indiscreet. Um, and I think in my role and, and I think in any particularly in my role, you know, it is trading on that information that, you know, and and and, and it's helpful. Um, but what I have found is that, yeah, and people might not 
you might not have those opportunities like you say the informal nature of meetings I've, I've my world's become smaller so I've done much more world uh, work abroad and I've done much more work across North America and um, and I always have done but it's it's been so much easier because there's no real difference between me trading in London or North America or Asia really other than you know the time scales so I think that's helped um, sorry there's a, a load of fireworks going off I don't know if you can hear that <laughs> Um, but look, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll start to wind things up. It'd be, yeah. So what's 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 next? What 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 are you guys focusing on with the my control now? Is it looking to add new products or or or, or just increase the distribution? Yeah, we're um, we're hoping to, to focus in, continue to focus on photographers and videographers, and uh, and go a little bit deeper with that. So um, we we launched the. Uh, the, the, the different versions of the app in uh, September 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so the first kind of part of that was, uh, you know, we were in the phase of what we call uh, proving product customer fit. So making sure that people will use it and that they like it and, and listening to that feedback. I, we didn't really do a lot of marketing in that phase. I did a lot of uh, in-person events. So we sponsored a few events. We did some exhibitions. I, uh, I talked at a few uh, meetups um, and things of that nature. So don't necessarily scale well, but it's very valuable to, uh, to get in front of people and have that dialogue. Um, and, and the sure. feedback was invaluable, um, even when people weren't, weren't buying policies on it. Um, and then fast forward to that, you know, I think we've got a good product customer fit. We've made a few tweaks on the app based on that feedback. We pushed those out kind of January, 2020 and uh, COVID was very difficult for, uh, for the photographers and videographers. Sure. So that kind of uh, threw some cold water on, uh, on where things were going. Um, they were just, you know, events were canceled and, uh, and those people weren't really working, um, you know, in the spring and summer, unfortunately. So we, uh, we just kind of took a pause and, um, you know, I had also to make sure that the traditional brokerage was, uh, was doing okay with, um, with this transition uh, to remote work and, uh, and just transacting business digitally for those uh, traditional brokers. But, um, you know, I think we're at a phase now where people have truly gotten used to this as, uh, as the new normal, at least for now. Uh, we've noticed the business pick up a little bit with uh, photographers and videographers. So most people are finding work. Um, you know, there are some limited events that are happening again. Um, something that I think is happening is with this transition that everyone's had to make this quick pivot to digital, um, especially businesses that weren't necessarily digital before people need these photographers and videographers to, uh, to put some digital assets together for them. If you're yeah. redoing your website, you need headshots or product shots or whatever it is. Um, if you're a real estate agent who's forced to do virtual showings now, uh, you want to have a professional touch to them. So you're hiring videographers to, uh, to film and photograph your spaces and, and mm. put it together. So it's been great to see that stuff start to come back. Uh, it's definitely different than things were pre COVID, but these people are, are working again, uh, which is great to see. So now we've had this kind of six month pause thrown at us, but our next phase is really to make sure that we can get some, some scalable sales traction um, with those categories. Uh, so we will be doing some paid advertising over the next four months and, uh, and seeing if we can scale it up. So we've got, you know, paid advertising channel and, uh, and we're also working on some partnerships uh, with people like retailers or other platforms, for example, that hire photographers. Uh -huh. That's a really uh, good way for us to try to scale and uh, acquire customers if we can integrate directly with them at the point of sale when they're booking these photographers. The nature of our product is that it's very easy to, uh, to just have uh, single days of coverage there for those people um, on a project basis. So, um, so that's really what our next four to six months looks like is, uh, is hopefully scaling this up. And, uh, and from there, you know, we've got the product customer fit. Hopefully we figured out a way to, uh, to scale it. And then our, our next phase would be to try to broaden out a bit, maybe going into the rest of Canada or start trying to expand into the U S yeah. Fantastic. I think it's, there's just an ongoing theme of like personalization of insurance and, and whether, whether you're a, um, whether you're a consumer on a sort of professional commercial basis or, or, or an individual, um, we're just seeing more and more of this theme. Cause I think, I think we're seeing more and more in that in our daily lives, aren't we? And we, we, don't, we don't want to pay for things that we, we don't utilize. So um, there's much more kind of focus on it. And, and yeah, my control just sounds like 
it's funny because I've got a few friends that they're professional photographers and, and one of their big bugbears is how expensive um, and one just moans about how expensive it is and then just pays for it um, the other one moans about how expensive it is and and it's so expensive he just chooses not to use it so and and as someone that works in insurance it always makes me like really uncomfortable when he's like I haven't got the insurance and I'm like yeah, you've got a five thousand pound camera, though. You know, so um, you probably <laughs> yeah. should, um, and it's definitely not covered. But um, yeah, it's really interesting, and the evolution into drones as well. I can I can see that being a huge thing. Um, but yeah, I, that, it's such a it's such an interesting thing about how sort of COVID's impacted because I you know it it's just stopped all of that stuff. But then I, I'm what, where I remain hopeful and, and want to end it on a positive note is that. Um, <laughs> The wedding photographers of this world will be the busiest people on the planet the second we can actually go out and do these things because I, I, someone said to me the other day that when it's actually finally over it's going to be the party to end all parties and it'll be like a global hangover for about six weeks so um yeah we um we seem to be a similar age and at a similar time in our life alex so i know we all want to get traveling again but i think once weddings are back we're going to be full-time wedding guests for a year it sounds like <laughs> with all the backlog of these weddings to get to and uh you know, definitely wanting to stay positive on things too. Uh, you know, these are some difficult times everyone's dealing with, but if you're a startup or an insurance broker or an insurer, and you can get through these dark times and, uh, and prove that you've got a resilient company, um, you're going to do really well, I think, in the post-COVID era. If you look traditionally at, at some of the recessions and global recessions that we've had, the companies that can make it through that, uh, you know, the sky's the limit once they get through those hardships. So, um, so I, I hope everyone listening uh, sticks to it. And, uh, and keeps digging because uh, there is light just around the corner. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's the like perfect way to end it because, um, yeah, I, uh, yeah I, 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 I love those stories that, that all these huge companies that come out of these difficult periods and, and it is difficult and I really feel for people out there. But I think what what's great and plays into the kind of um, solopreneur sort of experience is how many people are taking this opportunity to go off and do other things. And that's really heartening. So, um but look, thank you so much for being a guest. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, it was great to sort of hear about um, more of the ins and outs of the product. And um, look, fingers crossed that um, we, we we enter a busier period for both of us towards the 2020 and 2021. I think we will. Thanks for uh, having me on, Alex. No, you're welcome. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.